In the first part of our analysis of the Xbox Series X Hot Chips conference, I dived deeply into the CPU, GPU, as well as some of the functionality such as hardware-based ray tracing. But there was so much stuff Microsoft revealed for their next-gen console, so in this video we're going to be continuing our coverage of the Xbox Series X. I would like to spend just one moment to thank everyone who's recently been a new subscriber to the channel or perhaps you've been sticking around with us for ages. It's greatly appreciated and uh, quite humbling to have such tremendous support and uh, so many views and people message me. But with that all said, let's get on with things, shall we? You can also find this as an article which is linked in the video description of course as well as a um, link to the first part of our coverage for hot chips for the Xbox Series X. So if you do prefer the written word, you can naturally check out the article as well, or you can watch the video. Also, there are a number of slides which go along with this content, so I would suggest not watching this in the background, because otherwise you may not be able to follow along with some of the points I'm making. Since we focus so much on both the CPU and GPU in part 1 of this coverage, I think it makes sense for us to jump onto the Xbox Series X's audio processing capabilities. While there's much discussion on frame rate and ray tracing and other capabilities of the next-gen consoles, audio is likely to have just as much of an impact for next-gen, assuming that you've got the equipment to take advantage of it. If you've not already taken the plunge and purchased a great pair of new headphones or a surround sound setup to go ideally with a new shiny 4K TV for the next gen, now may be a good time to do so. I've thrown a few Amazon affiliate links into the video description if you want a couple of suggestions. But let's get back to the audio components. The Xbox One was interesting because it featured Shape, a custom designed audio block created by Microsoft. Shape was capable of handling 512 voices for game audio, and also the ability to run Connect voice commands too. This was important because Connect audio processing was quite demanding, and so having it offloaded to the CPU just wasn't a viable strategy for Microsoft to do in real time. Microsoft's strategy though worked very well, and it was one area where the PlayStation 4 fell behind the Xbox One, assuming that is a developer took advantage of shape. Sony's strategy relied more on the CPU for processing of audio, thus limiting the number of voices possible and effects used, because if you ate too much into the CPU budget, well, you'd obviously be taking away CPU resources from other things. Also, given the CPUs in the 8 uh, generation machines, again, which are based on Jaguar, as we've discussed at length in part one of this analysis, aren't exactly known for their high throughput and performance. Each and every cycle was even more precious. Sony and Microsoft for this generation, though, have outlined their respective visions for their next generation, and have outfitted their consoles with high-performance custom-built components designed exclusively for audio processing. The PlayStation 5 audio processing is done with the Tempest engine, which is essentially a tweaked and custom variant of a GPU's compute unit based on RDNA 2. It has its caches removed and operates using DMA, direct memory access. Cerny has stated in the Road to PS5 event that the Tempest engine is capable of performance about on par with the PlayStation 4's Jaguar processor, that is with 8 cores if all of them were dedicated just for audio. For reference, this is about 102 G-flops of performance for the PS4's CPU. To calculate this for the Jaguar, it's the clock frequency, the PS4 is 1600 MHz for the base frequency, multiplied by the number of CPU cores, which is 8, and then you multiply that by another 8. The slide for Microsoft here is rather interesting though, because the um, X, because Microsoft is stating that the SPFP math performance is greater than all of the Xbox One X's CPU cores working together. In some ways, a lot of what Microsoft is claiming is quite close to Sony in terms of functionality. Although technically the FP math, if accurate from Microsoft, is actually greater than the PlayStation 5 because the CPU clocks of the Xbox One X are 2.3GHz for the Jaguar, which is 600MHz faster than the PS5. 
Sony have made lots of HRTF claims for their Tempest engine, and Microsoft haven't done the same thing. And a lot of what they're discussing is slightly different in the way they're describing the audio components, which means direct comparisons in terms of raw performance are, at best, tricky. Microsoft have created three audio engines, CFPU2, Movad, and Logan. The first is the audio convolution, FFT and Reverb. Movad is what Team Green are referring to, Hyper Real-Time Audio Decoder, and it's capable of 300 uh, times channels simultaneous decoding and boasts a signal-to-noise ratio of over 100 dB. Logan is comprised of four DSP cores capable of a plethora of tasks, including audio effects and XMA decode. Microsoft, again, says that its ability for XMA decode is similar to what Movad can do in terms of its performance. Microsoft mentioned, again, the 300 times real-time channels, but while this may sound considerably less than the 5,000 sources from Sony, Sony points out that this number isn't really useful. It would be indistinguishable in the real world, and even if you were able to hear it, the audio quality of each sample would be not as good as you would ideally want. It would lack reverb and realistic uh, uh, sounding for the environment. So, as I mentioned, we lack a lot of detail on how the two audio solutions compare against one another. But I will also throw in just for a second that Microsoft mentioned security and decryption ability for its SOC, and it seems that Microsoft have designed these hardware engines, the audio, the security, and so on. It's hard to say if this is the only stuff Microsoft engineers have designed, or whether there's more that's not been stated here. To my understanding, Microsoft let AMD take the lead largely when it comes to the design of the CPU and GPU, and only asked for a few customizations here and there for certain functionality, i.e. such as the backwards compatibility for the Xbox One and other consoles. But now let's move over to the RAM, which of course is where the data for the games as well as the OS is stored. For the Series X, Microsoft went for split memory strategy. This is likely in an effort purely to cost-reduce the machine, but it does have the benefit of offering still a substantial amount of bandwidth to the console's GPU. To this end, there are two segments of memory, 10 gigabytes on a 320-bit bus offering 560 gigabytes per second, and another 6 gigabytes of, well, still pretty fast memory, 320, uh, 336 gigabytes per second. This is still more bandwidth than the Xbox One X, and it's 326. The 10 gigabytes is what Microsoft call optimum memory, and of course it's the faster bandwidth. This is ideally where you would store data destined for the GPU. The other 6 gigabytes is referenced as standard memory, and it's for things like the OS and system functionality, which has 2.5 gigabytes of this 6 reserved, leaving 3.5 gigabytes for games to use. Ideally, this would be for things like CPU um, data as well as uh, audio, and there's more than enough bandwidth to drive these components and also chip into the GPU if necessary. Naturally, like the PlayStation 5, 16 gigabytes doesn't seem a huge upgrade compared to 12 gigabytes of the Xbox One X, but these next-gen machines have a secret weapon. Well, okay, not so secret, the SSD. I've extensively covered how SSDs are important in a separate video, why SSDs in a console change everything. I'll try to remember to put a link to it, and I'll also be making part two of that video when we have more stuff confirmed for both consoles so we can draw more of a comparison on how they function. But for now, let's explain why an SSD is so important. Oh, and just before we do that, another rumor um, that we heard a lot before the consoles were formally announced was that there would be some type of HBM memory in them. Microsoft actually mentioned that uh, they weren't opposed to HBM, it just didn't suit them. Uh, Anantech actually uh, reported a follow-up to a question, we're not religious about DRAM tech to use, we needed the GPU to have a ton of bandwidth for lots of channels allow for low latency requests to be served. 
HBM did have an MLC model thought about, and people voted though with their feet, and JDEC just decided to not go with it. In other words, HBM2 wasn't fit for purpose for the Xbox Series X. Getting back to the SSDs, mechanical drives have a, as well as long latency to actually access this data because it takes time for the head of the HDD to find where this data resides on the spinning disk, aka seek time. SSDs allow gigabytes of data to be pulled into memory ridiculously fast, with the Xbox Series X capable of 2.4 gigabytes per second of raw speeds, but the actual number is 4.8 gigabytes per second on average, because you'll never not compress the data really. Microsoft have confirmed though that this 4.8 gigabytes per second is average and conservative, with real world speed being 6 gigabytes per second or faster, especially for textures, we'll get more into that in a moment. As I explained in a separate video, an exclusive, Sony is also working on ways to improve their lossless compression for the future. In other words, while the raw speeds will still be the same, the compression ratio will be higher, thus you will be able to pull in more data effectively. I think there's a good chance that the Xbox can do the same too. As we know by now, the Xbox Series X contains a total of one terabyte of space internally, with eight channels connecting the SSD to the rest of the system. According to Hot Chips, the internal storage connects via two PCIe Gen 4 lanes, which then, of course, get connected to the SSD. With another two lanes of the PCIe 4 uh, being dedicated for the user upgradable SSD, which, as we know, fits into the external slot. There are eight total lanes, though, for the I.O. hub, with the others being connected to things such as USB ports and other communication, such as, say, wireless. To this end, the Xbox Series X has a plethora of technology which aims to increase the speed data can be pulled into the system. And, of course, this means that the amount of RAM for all intents and purposes is way more, because you're able to quickly swap data in as needed, which has enormous benefits for things such as textures. Microsoft are keen to point out their velocity architecture as one of these um, star pieces of the show, and RAM prices have fallen previously in terms of quantity about 30% on a year-on-year -year basis. To put it another way, if you paid 100 bucks for X amount of RAM, in one year after that, it would be 30% cheaper for the same amount of RAM. But over the past several years, this has not been the case. And recent reductions in pricing have been comparatively very small. The memory in SSDs, though, is falling much faster. So this is where a high-speed pool of NAND memory, the SSD, comes in. Not only does it improve load times and enables things such as quick resume, it also means that Microsoft are free to pursue technology such as sampler feedback. We'll discuss that more in a moment. Interestingly, Microsoft also commented that they planned such a transition back in even 2007, so 13 years ago. This was a few years after the 360 launched, and so seven years prior to even the launch of the Xbox One, it shows you just how far ahead console manufacturers and the technology industry think. An SSD tech was hoped for for a future Xbox console again 13 years before it was made available. There's also custom hardware blocks to enable decompression from the SSD, as I mentioned earlier. Microsoft believe on average this will be a 2 to 1 compression ratio, which means 4.8 gigabytes per second, but can be up to 6 gigabytes per second in theory with certain data. This hardware block supports LZ decompression, an industry standard, along with Microsoft's proprietary tech designed around BC Pack. If this was being handled by the Zen 2 cores of the Xbox Series X solely, it would eat up over four of them, actually spilling into a fifth core. Again, this is why decompression is so important to have some type of hardware acceleration, and why PCs are embracing such tech too. For example, NVIDIA's RTX IO, which, funnily enough, has a similar, uh, a similar decompression ratio of 2 to 1. Getting back to the sampler feedback, though, texture maps are stored at different MIP levels, detail levels, and of course, which level of detail 
depends on a variety of things. Distance from an object, parts of the texture being visible, and so on. But with sampler feedback, a game engine can better understand what portions of a texture are actually being shown, i.e. what's visible to the rendered image. So this information can be a huge saving because lower quality textures can be replaced if necessary and memory savings are huge. No longer do you have massive chunks of data dedicated to an entire 4K texture when only a small portion of this texture, for example, would be shown. Textures can be split essentially into tiles and then portions of these tiles can be streamed in as needed. Sampler feedback allows only the relevant portions, textures, to be pulled into the main system memory. Microsoft states this is an effective increase in memory capacity for 2.5 times versus just loading in full 4K textures. VRS is another technology which has been heavily discussed by Microsoft, and indeed I have a full video dedicated variable rate shading, and I'm going to go into that a little here, but if you want the full rundown, I suggest you check that video out. I'll link it as usual. The idea of variable rate shading is that not all elements of a scene are as important as one another, with objects in your peripheral vision being something that which you perceive in less detail compared to something that's in your focus. To this end, the goal of variable rate shading is to divert rendering resources away from areas of scene which will be impactful. For example, maybe an object's in motion blur or something like that. So then you can increase shading, the drawing detail, of areas of scene which matter more, or to simply improve performance, i.e. so that each frame takes less time to be drawn. AMD's has uh, variable rate shading for its RDNA 2 line of technology, but this is not new or unique to AMD or Microsoft. NVIDIA have NAS, NVIDIA Adaptive Shading, which is part of the RTX 20 line of cards. Intel's range of GPUs, including its iGPUs, can support it too. API-wise, NVIDIA were using their own custom extensions, but for the PC and Xbox, it's now part of DirectX 12 Ultimate, or DirectX 12 underscore 2. The amount of space eaten up on the die of the GPU is tiny, as Microsoft mentioned, and it makes no sense for it to be included in a modern GPU. In fact, as I outlined in my PS5 APU Bring Up video, RDNA 1 had missed the feature because apparently they just couldn't get it working before the first generation of RDNA 1 for the desktop shipped. And it's very likely that RDNA 1 had originally been intended to launch with VRS, though I'm not 100% certain, I think it's a very good uh, chance. The issue with the RDNA 2 features not working actually caused Sony to have some problems with internal testing of its GPU, the infamous GitHub stuff. Basically, certain features were just not functional with uh, early testing, and it would cause crashes and problems with uh, RDNA 2 silicon with those uh, uh, features enabled. Does this matter for console gamers? No, because, well, you guys get the cool stuff. But it is a shame for people who purchased an RX 5000 because they could have gotten such cool features. Not ray tracing, though, because that was always intended for RDNA 2. While covered less with the Xbox event, I also want to bring up mesh shaders. I've again detailed these multiple times before, but I'll cover them again briefly here. They were first previewed on the mainstream Turing, and now a part of RDNA 2. Mesh shaders have a profound ability to change how the geometry pipeline of a GPU functions, and essentially are a rather different approach from the traditional graphics pipeline. You can see Microsoft demoing them here with the Xbox as well as the Turing architecture. Naturally, this has improved even further with the next generation of NVIDIA cards known as Ampere. So what is a mesh shader? Well, unlike a traditional graphics pipeline, mesh shaders run more like a compute shader, which provides a huge amount of control over culling and detail. In the old way of thinking, geometry and the like was processed as a whole, with vertices, corners of triangles, requiring to first be processed before you can even cull anything. This is an immensely complicated topic, and 
I don't want to get super deep into this for this video because it's already getting kind of long, but the problem with this process is it makes rendering slower because, well, not only can you not control the rendering process 100%, uh, how you would perhaps want to in terms of efficiency, but when you're wanting to cull geometry, for example, a back-facing part of geometry, that is, to be clear, geometry that you won't see, you just won't draw it, the earlier you can do it in the rendering process, the better, because otherwise you're just eating up more and more and more GPU time. I want to stress, though, that mesh shading is not a fix to this problem. It is not a tweak to the traditional rendering pipeline. It is basically throwing away the old methodology. It's not improving it, it's throwing it away and embracing something entirely different. As mentioned a moment ago, mesh shaders for the Series X and other supported hardware run essentially as a compute shader. Work is dispatched in thread groups, which are executed on the CU of the GPU, and not only is this more precise and with greater control, you also further benefit because you've got the ability to cull so much earlier in the pipeline and draw objects with a great deal more control and precision. NVIDIA's mesh shading demo, known as Asteroids, is a great example of this. Asteroids, well, it's just that really. <laughs> You're flying through a densely packed field of asteroids with faraway objects having just 20 triangles, so if you were close up to them, they wouldn't look much like an asteroid. But the closest on-screen asteroids have over 5 million triangles. For those who will immediately ask me, how does this compare about the PlayStation 5? The PS5 handles things differently than the Xbox. I'll simply say at the moment that the geometry engine works in conjunction with other elements of the console to perform similar but slightly different functionality. It is still immensely programmable and does have similar features to the Xbox, but the way Sony have implemented it, it's different. I'll cover more how this works in another video when Sony officially reveals more information. I've covered all I'm allowed to say about the PlayStation 5 geometry engine in other videos, so you can go ahead and check them out if you so desire. But, again, touching on the GPU evolution slide from Microsoft, the company plots a graph of how graphics tech has evolved since the debut of the Xbox One console in 2013. Seeing the leaps from the X1 to the Xbox Series X, it's clear that a number of things improve massively. As we've discussed many times on this channel before, T-flops between generations of GPU architecture aren't necessarily a great measurement of performance. Again, look at these RX 480 numbers versus the 5700. Don't forget we've configured the system to be a relative match, with Polaris and RDNA 1 cards running at the same clock frequency for two of these results, so their relative T-flops would be identical, but the 5700 was allowed to run at its default speed in another test. But still, there's a ton of other things in play. The Series X cranks up the number of triangles from 4.4 to 7.3 giga triangles, again, also being way more efficient. And thanks to the Xbox Series X doubling the number of ROPs over the Xbox One X, so 64 versus 32, as well as having higher clocks, gigapixel performance has also seen a massive increase. 35G pixels versus 116. You can, by the way, confirm the number of ROPs yourself for the Xbox Series X because Microsoft haven't directly confirmed it but have given you the numbers to confirm it. You can take 64 which is the number of ROPs multiplied by the clock frequency of the GPU 1835 and that will give you the G pixel results we're seeing here which is a direct result again of the number of ROPs. This is not only though that results we need to look at here. There's a massive improvement in the rendering efficiency of RDNA 2 against Polaris-based Xbox One X. You can check my first part of the analysis if you want further information. Well, let's draw some conclusions then. The Xbox Series X is marketed by Microsoft to be a monster, and I'm inclined to agree with them. The CPU and the SSD of the next gen is probably going to be a night and day difference versus this generation. The ability to have bigger, more expansive worlds, tons of AI, 
Better and almost immediate access to any piece of data required by developers gives tons of threat for flexibility, creative freedom, which just was not possible in the older generation. The GPU of console generations is what generally gets the most attention, and while the 12.1 TFLOPs is an easy thing to focus on, it's not the whole story of these consoles. The API and technology that's being built into the Xbox Series X is what's the real story here. Microsoft have two babies, the PC and the Xbox platform, and the Xbox is by and large a carbon copy of the desktop feature set of RDNA 2, with some customization here and there, removing things which are exclusively for desktop, and so on and so on. The next generation of NVIDIA cards have already been confirmed to handle things like data decompression directly on the GPU, again offloading work from the PC CPU cores, just like the Xbox. And given we're in a world where PC SSDs hit 7 gigabytes per second read speeds, this is raw data uh, read speeds, by the way, of sequential data, this is imperative, or the amount of data would just be huge and eat up CPU times. It's also worth noting that there's a ton of experimental tech which is being explored right now, especially when it comes to things such as direct um, ML. Machine learning, if you prefer. One of Microsoft Studios has been experimenting with using uh, direct ML to upsample low resolution texture assets and then upsample them in real time to a user. Apparently, so far, the experience is so good you couldn't tell the difference between a 4K or for native resolution texture versus a tiny lower resolution texture. It does have some limitations. For now, for example, it's very difficult to train AI in this, but I'm sure you can imagine the potential for the next gen. Technology too, such as ray tracing, is not just for pretty shadows, and more bounces in, and reflections. In theory, it's possible to use this advanced uh, ray tracing tech for AI and audio. In fact, it's not even a theory. I discussed this with NVIDIA in an interview, and Sony are already experimenting with this. It's outlined in a Sony 2020 technology PDF. I think it's pretty fair to say that Microsoft have similar plans for the Xbox too. So then, the Xbox Series X has technology to offer stellar visual experiences, and Microsoft has empowered developers with fairly balanced hardware. There's a lot of questions Microsoft still haven't given us with the console, and I suspect that Remaining NDAs from AMD um, are still probably in place for the RX 6000 series, so I suspect it will be a bit longer before everything's fully revealed. With that said though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. The normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment and subscribe, and thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.